Um, so, so just to get, a, get an idea of, of who's here, and because everyone's been sitting down for hours, uh, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands for various things. Um, first of all, OWASP likes to divide people into de builders, uh, defenders, and breakers. Um, if you're not familiar with those categories, that's a good thing to go Google as soon as you're out of this session. But raise your hand if you consider yourself a builder, a developer, um, someone, okay, wow, that's a pretty good, good size, Some involved in the SDLC in general. Raise your hand if you're a breaker and you, um, yeah, okay, good, everyone knows what that is. We're at a you know, hacking related conference. And what about defenders? People are more operational or perhaps policy oriented, process oriented, okay. We have a good mixture, this is good. A lot of times, um, giving a talk to this crowd, it's already people who know everything about security, and then they boo me because you know I'm just telling them how to use tools that they already know about. So this is actually a really good audience. Uh, if I'm going too fast or skipping over some technical details, uh, feel free to ask me about them. But I am not going to go too much into depth about the actual attacks that the tool is conducting. Um, there's a lot of other OWASP talks on that. Um, and um, who's, another question, who's heard of Zap? Good, okay, almost everyone's heard of it. I was looking through the um, talks at this conference, and of all the tools mentioned, Zap, my talk is the only one that mentions it. Zap is an OWASP flagship pro project. It's the most active OWASP project. It has 28 uh, current contributors. Um, development contributors, as more non-development contributors, including 50 translators. Uh, it's been translated into, I believe, 20 languages. I actually have them written down, but I don't have to tell you all of them, including Urdu. Um, and, uh, and yet, when a lot of conference proceedings, even OWASP conference proceedings happen, people are talking about AppScan, Burp. Uh, it's, to a certain extent, you know, this is just a vendor presentation. I'm just trying to sell you on OWASP uh, uh, goodies. The good news is that it's completely free and open source. So free as in beer and free as in speech. Um, and so, you know, I accept tips, but uh, there's, no, there's no salesman to deal with other than me right now. Um, let me get started. Um, the goal of this presentation, other than to amuse you with cute little comic clips, because, you know, Warner Brothers comic themes, I don't actually have any Batman stuff to give away, uh, is, is to make your life better, either conducting assessments, um, knowing what's generally possible, or uh, I actually saved someone 30 bucks today because they were using the Charles proxy, which is a really good development proxy. Uh, and they're using it because it has breakpoints. It allows you to use breakpoints in web applications uh, from the client side. Some of you might not know anything of what I'm talking about right now. But he's paying, paying 30 bucks because he likes Charles Proxy, like this feature in Charles Proxy. And um, I was like, oh yeah, Zap has had that since like version 1.0. And he's like, oh cool, all right. I guess I can cancel that subscription. Yeah. Um, but I have a secret motive, and it's not very secret because I put it up on the slide. And that's because Zap has, uh, hasn't had as much traction so far in the community. I want to spread the word. I want people to get involved. I want people to uh, use the very easy recording and uh, testing uh, tools. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. To develop new tests for things that aren't already included in the um, primary packages and, and modules that you can load. Share them with the community. Make OWASP tools better in the long term. And then I can just use them and make my job easier, so it's really very selfish. Um, a little bit about me, as long as I'm talking about how selfish I am. Uh, I have about eight years of AppSec experience. I'm an active OWASP contributor. So a number, number of talks, a few of you have actually seen this talk already. Sorry, Ken. Um, I wrote a book called The Web Application Security Testing Cookbook very long title. It's now five years old and completely out of date, um, but it's, it's good for you. Uh, and I'm currently working at Warner Brothers, I mentioned that. Um, what else was I going to say? I had a whole thing and I figured I would remember the one that was about me, so. Um, anyways, continue. 
So, oh yeah, the thing I was going to say is I'm actually not a Zap contributor. I'm not a developer who's contributed stuff to uh, Zap. Um, the only reason I ended up doing this conference, this talk, is because um, a bunch of people I know we were talking about, you know, how cool this tool was. I ended up doing it at a local OWASP talk, and they're like, "Hey, that was great. Do it again." Even though you know you're not an, an official Zap guy, uh, we we are lucky enough to have someone here who is an official Zap evangelist. Um, his name is Aaron Guzman. He's in the front. I'll actually pull him up here uh, at some point during the demonstration. And because I work for Warner Brothers, I have to give the official you know disclaimer that I do not represent Warner Brothers' opinions, but you do get free swag. Um, I mentioned that the Zap, although it looks like 90% of the people in here have heard of it, maybe just from other talks today, uh, is not as widely distributed in terms of recognition in the industry. Uh, actually, just last month, this Tools Watch website voted it the best web application security tool, um, or not just web application, just security tools in general, over Beef, over Burp, over some really awesome other tools. Um, so if you haven't, if you've played around with Beef and you've said, you know, this is crazy stuff, I can take over people's uh, browsers, or I use Burp every day because it's a great proxy and it has a good scanning system, take a look at Zap. It's, it's starting to really compete at that level, and soon, thank you. I, I'm usually just used to being loud. Um, it's starting to compete even at the enterprise level, and we'll talk a little bit about how you can use it in ways that uh, commercial products like AppScan or WebInspect aren't actually keeping up with. They're, they're focusing more on reporting and, and uh, having a central console where it's a lot easier to build Zap right into your development process or your continuous integration uh, server or build. Um, this is a lot of talking. I really want to get to the demo. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of the features. It does have a spider. It does have a lot of other uh, interesting features. It has more features than we'll actually be able to demonstrate today, which is why another reason why I want you to interrupt me with questions and ask, hey, can you impersonate the Google bot? Or, hey, um, can you look at Ajax requests even though it doesn't have, you know, uh, it doesn't show you an actual browser. It doesn't actually execute JavaScript. Um, and I'll go over some of the features as we're working on the demonstration. So, demonstration. Um, we, I, now that I have internet connectivity, I'm willing to scan any application that I am authorized to scan. If any of you would like to volunteer an application, you have a few seconds to speak up before I just go and grab one from the OWASP vulnerability, vulnerable web applications directory project. Um, I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, it's too bad. Um, <coughs> yes, um, this list is maintained by OWASP, but the apps are not all from OWASP. Um, but it includes online applications that you can access right now in your web browser, offline or virtual machine containing applications where you can test locally, which I have one installed actually in case the Wi-Fi wasn't very good. Uh, and these are fantastic for practicing your web application security foo. Um, I, OWASP actually has a couple different um, challenges like the academic challenge. They, they also have uh, things like OWASP Bricks, OWASP WebGoat. Uh, WebGoat is actually not a uh, application as much as it's a series of tutorials on how to conduct um, I essentially look, look for vulnerabilities in web applications. I strongly recommend it. Um, but I'm talking about Zap, so. Um, the one I usually use is um, Altura Mutual, but I, I'm willing to conduct this test on anything live if anyone has a favorite. No one's, no one's saying? All right, okay, we're going to load it up. This is Altura Mutual. It's not an actual bank. Um, it's maintained by uh, IBM and Watchfire for demonstrating their tool. Uh, the, the reason I actually like using this one is it's because it's an OWASP competitor. Uh, we're not rigging the system and showing you an OWASP tool scanning another OWASP application that's, you know, has, of course, has all the insight into what's vulnerable or not. 
this, uh, this is a competitor and Zap still finds almost all of the issues. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is uh, open up Zap. Yeah. That is a very good question, and I was about to demo that. Um, the answer is, it's ridiculously easy to uh, get working. This folder on my desktop in my VM is literally just an unzip of the files that I got, got off of the Zap website. Oh, I did want to show that off a little bit. Um, there is the OWASP page, you can see, um, that has the usual stuff, but also a Google code page that has a tremendous amount of documentation. So if, if you guys stump me today, which I highly encourage you to try to do, I'm, I'm going to look it up on here. And, and that's not going to be, you know, I'm going to be embarrassed, but it's going to be further testimonial to how good the tool is and um, the documentation supporting it. I, I forgot to mention, Simon Bennett's the project lead for this, uh, uh, for this project, flagship project, is extremely responsive. If you have questions, there's a Google group. You can email him. You can tweet him. Um, when I first gave this talk, he actually found me first before I knew you know, who to contact to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to talk about this tool. And he's like, hey, can we list you on our upcoming Zap Talks page? Um, so he's, he's on it. He also has a really like, cool British accent. So if you want additional Zap training, he actually has some available um, on the OWASP page uh, about the features and then demonstrations of some of the more advanced features. Um, I, a little anecdote. I was preparing for this talk, watching some of his training, and my girlfriend uh, commented like, oh, who's that? Is, is he going to be at the conference? Because uh, she really likes British accents. We'll just leave it at that. Um, so in terms of installing Zap, unzip it. Uh, it has you know, a bat for Windows. I'm going to run the... Um, the, uh, the bash script, the shell script. Um, it's being a little slow because it's a VM. And it's up and running. It will automatically check for updates, blah, 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 normal. But um, yes, thank you. I'm going to install some updates. This was literally just downloaded. Like um, There has been no other installation steps involved. So I am going to update the Zap components. One of the things about Zap that is uh, really cool, I'm going to finish this sentence then, you can, okay, um, is that it's actually a collection of a lot of other tools. It's a little bit uh, like you know, Metasploit and other things like that, where um, there used to be this thing called Peros Proxy, and there's a thing called Durbuster, and there's a bunch of other OWASP tools. Zap is more of a framework for combining all of these tools in a robust way, and so adding additional functionality, uh, either developing it yourself or grabbing something that someone else has developed, is really as easy as going over to this tab and checking for new updates. Um, it's really modular. Uh, I'll get to show off a little bit. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Durbuster, but it's a forced browsing um, testing tool that is, is built in. So this is Zap. Uh, one of the questions was, how easy is it to get started? You can literally type in your URL right here. Um, and I'm going to stop because I promised to answer your question. Oh, I'm running this in VirtualBox because I don't trust you guys, basically. Um, I'll just switch this to full screen because I don't need my slides anymore. Um, it, it runs on, it, it, it depends on Java um, or OpenJDK. That's the only dependency. Um, and so one of the questions was, how easy is it to get started? It is literally as easy as putting in a URL and saying attack. Now, this will not be a very robust web application assessment, uh, but it'll at least give you a spider and an outline of some of the basic issues. Uh, I actually am not going to do that because I want to show off even more fancy things. Uh, they, have, they have recently... Um, introduced a feature so that if you, if you attack a uh, URL like I am right up here, uh, it will not actually spider outside of that domain and get you in trouble for you know, scanning the entire internet. Um, I like that feature. 
Um, but the other thing that Mozilla especially has been working on, and Simon Bennett's the project lead, uh, is works full time at Mozilla, is an, a browser plugin called Plugin Hack, uh, and it's actually built to support a variety of proxies. But it it's so well built into Zap that it makes it really easy to get up and running. I don't know how many of you have worked with proxies before, where you have to, you know, tell it to listen on a port. You go into your Firefox or Chrome settings. You say proxy through this port. You have to take that off when you're going to check your Gmail, or else it yells at you. Or you're trying to deal with like analytics things going in the background, and you only want to proxy certain domains. It it gets complicated. This takes a lot of that effort out of it. I literally click plug and hack, click the setup button. It has a little, you know, only do bad things for good reasons um, uh, disclaimer. Uh, it says, hey, you're not running plug and hack. Would you like to install it? I trust um, OWASP, so I'm going to install it. Don't have to even reboot Firefox. I don't know when they fixed that because every since the beginning of time, you've always had to restart Firefox to install plugins. Um, I agree that I am doing bad things and I understand what I'm doing. That's probably a lie, but I'll click it anyway. Um, and it's going. That's it. I'm now proxying all of the traffic from this browser through Zap. Uh, for those of you, I'm using the word proxy. Um, is anyone not familiar with how proxies work? I shouldn't phrase it in a negative. Is, is everyone familiar with how proxies work? Do we need more raising of hands? Okay, I'm getting lots of nods. Okay, good. So if I go to Altaro Mutual again, Zap should have picked that up. Oh, geez. Thanks a lot. This is what Alt Tab is for. There we go. So Zap, being a good uh, uh, proxy, is telling me, hey, you visited this site. And if you drill down a little bit, you visited these pages. Even though I only requested a single page, it's loaded the CSS, the images. You can tell it to ignore images if you want. It tells you how you requested them, which method, HTTP method, uh, and it'll tell you parameters once we start doing more advanced parameter things. Uh, that is a good question. Um, I believe it's under filter. So tools, filter. Um, Too many features. Maybe not under tools and filter. I might have to go look that up on uh, the documentation. I did not expect someone to stump me that quickly. Um, I, I, I never pay attention to images, but yeah, that, that could. Um, yes, I know you can write a script for everything because you're a Zap Pro, but yeah. What's that? Tools options. Exclude from proxy. Up there. Local proxy. Thank you. No, oh, no, that's just where it's listening. We will figure this out and get back to you. Okay. Um, so one of the reasons that Zap um, as a proxy, everyone who's used a proxy, you, you've done this before. But one of the things that they, it really brags about is its authentication and session handling uh, capabilities. So. I don't know how many of you have used Burp or AppScan, but typically, or other tools, there's a lot of vendors here who have great tools. Um, typically, you provide a set of login credentials, or you, or you demonstrate um, logging into the application, and it records it in order to replay it for attacks. Zap not only does that, but has a session tracking mode, um, which I'm doing up here if you can't read it. Um, and what that's doing, all it's doing is just turning on a checkbox that say, look for session cookies. Uh, you can define what session cookies like, what they look like if you'd like. Um, and so what Zap actually offers the capability to do is have multiple roles in the same application and test them all rather than just providing a single set of login credentials. Um, so now if I go back to Altero Mutual and sign in as J Smith. Um, and I believe my password is demo1234. Um, a caveat for people who aren't used to working with proxies. Uh, the proxy will pick up all of that in plain text. Uh, so don't use test accounts, not your real passwords. Um, but Zap has now figured out that I went to a login page and posted some data, including 
a submit button, password, and user ID. Um, I can tell Zap, hey, uh, include this every time you want to log in. Um, it's, it's really simple. It will just repeat that post. Uh, and it asks you if you want to define you know, some regular expressions, or uh, you can specify some other options like how to log out. I can even do the log out um, and then go and specify, yes, that's a log out. Uh, I should mention contexts really quickly. Uh, this, I'm, I'm flagging this in a context, context. My context is how it remembers which application I'm scanning. Uh, if you're scanning something that spans multiple domains, you can assign multiple domains as part of one context and scan them all together and still avoid scanning the entire internet. Um, you can have multiple contexts open at the same time, so you can compare your, your QA box to your integration box to your production box if they allow you to scan production, um, and say, hey, it looks like QA has an issue that production doesn't. Why are these environments differing? Um, you guys told me they were the same, things like that. Um, I'm not going to get into that right now because we only have a single context, which is by default named number one. Um, however, uh, at this point, the HTTP sessions tracker has picked up, if you can read this, that I am logged in, or I was logged in using an ASP session ID. Uh, it will remember that session ID and attempt to use it again. Uh, this application is really poorly made, and so it won't actually is issue me a new session ID if I log in again. Um, so I'm not going to be able to demonstrate uh, uh, getting a new session ID and, and showing it tracking multiple sessions at once. Uh, if your sessions time out, that can cause some failures, but as long as you have some recent ones loaded, it, it will attempt all of them. Uh, let's go back. So let's, let's actually conduct a scan. Um, all I've done so far on this site is log in and log out. That's it. So we have no further business context for what's going on. We have no idea of uh, uh, how the application works. Um, often that's how applications are handed to security analysts. But um, we can at least start to explore by going to the site, doing something as simple as telling it to um, spider the site, spider the context. Um, and fortunately, this is a very small site. It's going to give you a prompt to begin a spider and tell you what all of the results are. But as many of you know, um, there are often pages like admin interfaces, uh, debug interfaces, leftover code that you won't be able to find through links from the main pages, or a spider won't be able to find. Um, and at that point, you can use the force browsing tool load up some very large lists of, um, of directories that um, are commonly used for different frameworks and begin that as a separate scan. These all run in parallel. It's really quick and easy. Uh, this will actually take probably 20 minutes, so I'm not going to let the full thing continue. But it is, it is saying, like, oh, look, it's found. Um, oh, those are 302 errors. Anyway, never mind. Um, and it'll start to populate this site uh, description with everything that it's found. Again, um, this is pretty basic so far, but it's um, I'm about to get to some of the more advanced things. I mentioned breakpoints. You have a question. Um, very, very easily. I'm not doing it now because I only have a single page loaded, but there's the, the concept of contexts. Uh, you can define whether or not you want to include different URLs in a context, um, and you can define those by regular expression. Um, or you can exclude URLs by regular expression. Yeah, um, and I think it'll it'll accept, you know, just if you want to do star dot you know yahoo dot com, don't scan Yahoo. It doesn't have to be a fully um, fleshed out regex. Yep, and by default, I, I glossed over this, by default, whatever you enter either into um, the, the URL to attack or you trigger via the attack functionality, it will only scan what is currently listed under that URL or that domain. So if you have, um, I'm sure I have some other stuff from 
Google isn't, you know, spying on me? That's so unusual. Um, okay, now I have some traffic from Google. It shows up in the proxy, but if I say um, I've included this in a context, you know, it's, it's there, and now I say scan only this context, uh, or this site, or this subtree, or this URL, um, it's only going to grab that one context. Uh, I even believe that it defines the scope um, contextually, and if I hit this, it wouldn't scan Google. I'm a little afraid to try that right now, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Um, there's also a concept of uh, different modes that it can operate under if for the truly paranoid. Uh, it starts in standard mode by default, but protected mode will uh, prevent you from conducting any scans against something you have not explicitly stated as part of um, uh, your context or um, uh, there's some other ways of filtering it down a little bit. Safe mode won't let you conduct any scans at all. It's kind of a, you know, don't let me cause any problems until I'm ready to launch the scan. Question? I'm really confused. So what's the actual difference between context and scope? Um, context, I believe there can be multiple contexts in scope. Um, and there can be multiple domains or URLs in a context. I believe I haven't set Google to be part of my scope. Okay. Um, well, that's in that box there, yep. Uh, and so it shouldn't scan it. Do you want me to see what happens? I, th I believe our other scan is. I haven't started another scan. So if I if I say scan all in scope, we're gonna. We're going to kick this off. Um, oh, thank you. Yes, I know. I. You have a target next to the folder, so you have the scope from the selected by context. Thought I did that. Oh, there's the little target. Okay. Thank you. This is why it's good to have professionals. Um, question in the back. Yep. So uh, they've got the list modes, but they have a full uh, attack mode where it did everything, so complete uh, forcing. Uh, I'm not sure the dis so distinction. Have, uh, in Sturbox, they've got the, the list mode, but they also have the brute force everything. Oh, um, that's a very good question. The forced, so the, the question was, does the forced browser attempt to fuzz or find things that aren't part of an established dictionary? Uh, and the, the answer is, it does make the distinction in this tool between forced browsing, where it goes through an entire directory list of, of known um, paths, and outright fuzzing, where you can say, change this parameter to random values or values in a, um, uh, a grammar. Or you can set it to a single item if you just want to hammer something over and over and over again. Um, I didn't kick off my scan. One of the issues I was having preparing for this, this talk is that there are actually so many features baked into this that I don't have time to go over all of them. So please keep asking questions like that. Like if you're like, I love burp. Does this do this other thing that burp does? Like decode strings automatically? Um, the answer is yes, but there's no way anyone would ever know that that's you know, in the edit tab for something like that until you check the documentation. It's, it's a work in progress. I actually think, Aaron, it's releasing a, Simon's releasing a new version. 2.8 should be released uh, in the middle of February. Awesome. There you go. Um, I was going to try out to see if I, if I do anything bad if I scan the entire scope. But it's actually not. OK, chalk this up to um, demo errors. Oh, I forgot to use my line. This will be. 50% talking, 50% demo, and 50% errors. That was going to be my big line. There we go. So it actually won't even let me scan everything in scope if I just click that. It, it makes me define which URL I want to use. Um, it has a number of built-in uh, uh, canned tests. I have to use the usual disclaimer that canned tests are very dumb. Uh, they will not replace security engineers anytime soon, so you can all relax. 
because a can test will know if, if, if something was echoed back as unvalidated input, which is a standard kind of technology stack uh, issue, like that causes HTML injection or cross-site scripting. But it will never be able to understand that being paying your bill for one cent is a bad thing. It'll just click submit on that form and say, hey, it looks like the transaction took place and there were no errors and none of the input you know, came back out uh, unescaped, and so I'm happy. Um, humans are usually better at that, I have to say. Uh, in fact, if, if you're able to pay for one cent in a billing form, I'm pretty sure humans will find that for you uh, pretty soon. Uh, but you can see some of the tests that it knows about. Um, these are constantly being upgraded and updated. Uh, in fact, you can look at the alpha versions of the upcoming changes uh, just through the zap module download function. They, they call it the marketplace. Um, I actually have a very small set of tests loaded right now, which is why this is going so fast. Um, by default, it's a small number of tests. You have to specify, yes, I want all the beta testing rules. I want the SQL map rules. I want the uh, WAPalyzer rules. I want the uh, other kinds of rules. Um, but if you're just looking for like, I've started a security assessment. I, you know, my boss only gave me 24 hours to do it. This is a great way of getting an idea of the um, kind of the, the edge of the application, the perimeter of the application, the attack surface. Uh, I can even say that someone on my team who's here right now uh, did a very smart thing and was looking for all of our entire attack surface across all of our applications, took a DNS dump of um, our DNS server, which you know says all the different domains that we host, um, plugged it into a tool like this and just spidered all of them. So you could say, yeah, here's all the URLs that are easy to get to on um, all of your applications, which, yes? So interesting that you mentioned your boss gives you a site, gives you 24 hours to do a security assessment. Yep. Well, this, I was just given this site, and it, would, it just an API. So it's yes. not actually, and it's just this name of board 8080. Is there anything I can use with this to see if there's any vulnerabilities if I start sending traffic to that API? So the question was, uh, if, if you have an API to test and uh, nothing really to spider, can you use this to just get an immediate impression on, on the security of the API? And, um, and, I have to have it done by tomorrow. and you have, have to have it done by tomorrow. <laughs> My question to you would be, do you have a WSDL or a set of regression tests? Neither. Do you have like any idea how to use the API? Nope, just given a site with an address and said test it. Um, <laughs> if you were able to go to the API yourself and like, figure out the values, do you think you could make it work? Probably not. Oh man, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, APIs are a little interesting usually if they're SOAP or uh, RESTful APIs and they don't give you a definition of the interface, you're in trouble because uh, well, it's... Like Alright. Um, <laughs> it's it's going to be really hard to brute force all of the API calls, um, figure out the tokens that they're looking for. If you do have a WSDL, this tool doesn't currently support WSDLs natively. Aaron, you can back me up on that. Um, but I, I believe it's in the works. Uh, one of the things I did want to mention is if, if you're like bleeding edge and working with web sockets, which is a horrible security event waiting to happen, um, personal opinion, uh, doesn't reflect a Zap. Zap actually has the best in class web socket support of any tool currently on the market. Um, mostly because I think Mozilla guys are working on this tool. It, some of the other products, like the commercial products, don't yet support the level of analysis that Zap does. Uh, it can sniff the entire WebSocket stream. Yes? Just a comment to the gentleman in front. If you're, if you're in a, lang a modern language, go figure out, most people are using frameworks, go grab their routes file, because a lot of the security guys have access to their source, okay. scan their routes file, and then use that to attack. So if you're if it's Node and they're using Express, there's going to be a routes file that you can literally just run a regex against and grab all the routes. Okay. Um, if it's um, I think if it's Django, if it's Rails, if it's um, and I think even a lot of PHP, well, the PHP stuff just grab a bunch of files and hit it. Um, but that's what I would suggest is just, just go grab a, grab the source code, okay. grab a list of their routes from whatever um, framework they're using. Oh, you're fine then. Yeah. Uh, if you have a client, if it's a thing, not a web browser client, you can get and install the client, and it's not HTTPS. It's privileged sent traffic and watch what the request looks like. Okay. Yeah, so you can do a lot. Yeah, it's like a little proxy as well. Okay. 
you mentioned HTTPS. One of the things that I forgot to mention is that Zap will allow you to spoof certificates and set it set itself up as a uh, trusted certificate source, so that as you are using HTTPS on your application, uh, and Zap is then acting as a man in the middle, um, your browser will still be happy and not issue lots of errors uh, if if you tell it to. Um, I was going to say. Our scan actually is, is done, our basic scan of not very many rules. Um, it, one of the things I'm going to talk about in a moment is like the reporting and enterprise capability of Zap. It's not as professional as some of the tools that you pay for yet. It's getting there. Um, but 10 years ago, this would have been a $50,000 engagement. Um, Zap is telling us it's found a number of, of issues. Uh, because it's an OWASP tool, it's going to give you a tremendous amount of detail on that issue. This is pretty standard for scanning tools. Um, however, it's, it's, uh, as far as I know, there's no free scanning tool that does it to this depth. So it, kind of the advantage of Zap is that it, um, it's getting better really fast, and it's perpetually free. Um, I will say... I'm not going to get into the actual attacks that it found, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, things like that. Um, it'll, it'll show you the request and response and why it thinks it found it. Uh, but to get a little higher level, uh, there, even the advanced alpha state rules that they're working on probably don't compete with tools like, um, say, burp proxy, if you're familiar with it, or app scan, or web inspect. Uh, they're just not as comprehensive yet. Uh, because it's an open source effort and lots of people are contributing, I do believe it is getting there faster than the other products are maturing. So it'll catch up and maybe uh, pass them in, in probably the next year. Um, but I would, not, I would not expect anyone to rely solely on this product for the scanning capability. That said, I believe it is the best manual assessment tool for web applications. The, the ability to to um, uh, track all of the assets of a site, uh, proxy traffic, do the usual proxy things like edit requests and resend them, um, or uh, set up breakpoints, which is the last thing I'm going to demo. Don't let me forget. Uh, it is, is helpful in assessments. It's helpful in, for debugging if you're a developer. It's, um, I would recommend this tool for for almost any sort of uh, web assessments. I've got two questions, one over there on the right, and then over there. Sir. Thanks. So um, back to the original presentation you wanted to yep. point. Does it tell you or link to a place where the code could be fixed? So for example, like the drop set, uh, something breaks and say, okay, this is what we could have done to alleviate that, or we could see that there's something we deeper or more inherent to bug, here's a link on one of the resources. Uh, so the question was, uh, does it even does it give you examples of how to fix it uh, in the code of the application itself, or or the the response of the application itself, or provide links to uh, other resources so you can learn about the issue? And the answer is yes. Um, you can replay the attack very easily and examine it manually. Um, they, there is OWASP standard guidance pulled into this little solution tab. Remember I said the reporting is not quite enterprise level yet, so I don't expect anyone to be able to read this as I scroll through it. Um, and it does link to uh, standardized projects like um, the common weakness enumeration uh, MITRE catalog of what this weakness is, how, where it pops up, how to fix it. Uh, one of the features it does not offer yet, which many of the, the vendor products are, is source code integration. This will tell you where in the uh, HTTP response it thinks it found the vulnerability, but it won't tell you in the develop in the application code, like where the system not system call where the uh, library call is that it thinks is is poorly handled. Um, so they still have they still have some features to sell. Uh, they're not going to go out of business, you know, tomorrow. Um, how are we on time? Got about ten minutes. Breakpoints. Um, any other questions about doing like a really basic spider and scan? Yes. Oh, you had a question. I, I skipped you. Sorry. Oh, um, is there a command line interface that I can basically take this, drop it into a CI loop, and um, then shove that in as an output to uh, the end of my build? 
so the question was, is there an, a command line or API interface that allows you to uh, automate this or include it in a build? Uh, and that is one of the key selling points of Zap, is um, how uh, automatable it is. It actually has an API even within Firefox as part of that plugin, so you can get used to using the API um, from, I don't know if you can see this, it's all the way down in the corner. Uh, you can practice with the IP API manually and then script it in Python, Ruby, uh, JavaScript, or Zest, which is a Mozilla language uh, that they're developing. We have until 3.30, right? 3.45, oh, okay. Aaron, you're gonna have plenty of time. Uh, Aaron's gonna be speaking a little bit about Zest. What Zest allows you to do is um, actually record and play your own attacks and edit them in JSON format so you don't have to script out the way that a lot of um, um, tools require you, you know, submit this URL with these headers with uh, these data values. You can, you can record what you're already doing, edit the values you care about, insert, you know, random values or, or custom values if you want and just hit play. Um, what's I going to get to next? Um, and in, in terms of continuous integration, uh, I, I don't know if you were at the um, uh, is DevOps at the sp no at the speed of DevOps and um, Matt, you were I, what was the, the title of your talk? Uh, how to DevOps Thank you, yeah. thank you. He actually mentioned uh, Zap as one of the tools that is very good to use as a proxy for your regression tests to get an instant dashboard of hey, what are the, some of the common scannable uh, errors that might have come up in this build? Uh, and if you, if you include it in your build process, then you don't have to necessarily send it over, to, over the fence to the security team to get it assessed. The developers have the results almost in real time. Um, and I don't want to steal any of your thunder, even though you stole some of mine. But it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty clever way of hooking it up. Um, I don't have time to get into the API right now. Uh, everything that you can do, you can do through the API. The front end is essentially just a front end for API calls. Um, yep. Including launching a browser, like you can, uh, the, ah, gosh dang it. Um, the Ajax Spider actually launches a browser and, and executes JavaScript and all of the other things that you consider standard parts of a regression test. Um, so that it doesn't have to be just like a command line interface that never renders anything for real. Um, all right. The question was, can you configure the rates for the spider? And the answer is yes. Um, there's a lot of options that I don't, won't get into right now, but um, the, the spider, the regular spider allows you to define to, to how deep you want to crawl, the number of threads you're going to use, any uh, any other specifications you don't you want to handle whether or not you want to obey robots txt which most of the time when you're doing security work you don't but you know you can if you want to be nice um, and additionally almost every other module allows you to specify um, um, kind of the rate you want to do it the Ajax scanner allows you to the Ajax spider which does launch a browser. Uh, ask you how many browsers you want to launch, how many threads per browser, those sorts of things. So you don't have to crash either your server or the application server, or your, your endpoint or the application server. Um, questions? Yes, sir. That's correct. Yeah, so uh, the question was, um, when, you're, when you're manually going through an application, how do you know it's not performing malicious attacks in the background? Or is there a specification to turn that off? Uh, and the short answer is, although it does have a passive vulnerability detector, it will not conduct any malicious tests until you explicitly tell it to use either the, the, um, the 
Active Scan or the Fuzzer. Um, those modules have to be manually activated. Uh, passive vulnerability detection uh, is not as strong of a feature because it, it doesn't have the capability to play with your application. But if you're using headers that are overly broad, like you allow uh, cross, your cross-domain policy to accept input from the entire internet, it can pick that up and tell you that even before you've launched an official scan. Um, again, features that I wasn't even going to talk about today, but I'm glad you asked, so thank you. Um, and um, uh, one, of the, one of the distinctions is this does not have a safe tests um, set of tests like, say, Nessus Scanner does. Uh, if you're running the active scans, it's going to be trying to break things. So that's a caveat. You might not want to scan your application using an admin credentials, or else it would be very happy to go to the delete all users button and click it um, just as part of the normal scanning process. You can also scan the cache button. Yep. Um, and in fact, I wanted to demo how powerful this was just as a debugging tool. Uh, and so I'm going to go briefly to the breakpoints tab uh, and set up a breakpoint. Um, Let's look for a value that I want to I want to find. Let's say I am. Um, let's say I want to find every single time my my savings account number comes up, as I am uh, developing or debugging or assessing this application. Now, an account number, a a um, an automated scanner with can tests, it's not going to care about an account number. It it just sees that as arbitrary data. However, your PCI auditor might care about account numbers. Uh, so you, as you're developing, you want to know where that data is exposed. Um, there is a, a breakpoint quick button. Uh, where to go? Add custom HTTP breakpoint. You can also do it through, um, uh, where is it? Is it in filters? No, that's the replace function. I wanted to demo that too. But uh, Oh, there, there's the break tab. And you can do it for individual pages um, by defining a break on that page. Or you can do it for any time you see it in any request body, request header, or response data. Um, I'm going to go ahead and define one for um, any time in the response body that I see my account number. And this is probably going to fire a lot. So what will happen is if I go to my account summary, um, you'll notice that my browser is frozen. It's, it's waiting for a response forever. If you've used proxies with intercepting mode, you're used to this. But if you've used proxies with intercepting mode, you're also using, used to going back to the proxy and click, OK, go, OK, go, OK, go. Yeah, I don't care about Google Analytics. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. I only want to look at one thing which is why breakpoints are conceptually um, uh, an easier solution, a more natural solution. Uh, at this point, um, Zap has opened up the break tab and is telling me that, um, I, that it has received a response that includes, let me pull this down a little bit, that includes um, that, that value. I'm going to search for that value rather than scroll. And there you see it's found that value. It's in there many twice at least. Um, and so it's it stopped this um, uh, request and response from completing from your client to the application server. Um, when you let's see. Um, when you're when you're happy with the output either because you are um, I mean, you're not testing anything in particular. You can forward it along. Where'd the button go? Why am I looking up there? Um, there it is. It's, it's the standard debugging tools. Um, you can say, I'm done checking this, this breakpoint. Uh, go ahead and submit it back to the server and continue until you find another breakpoint um, or, or another single response. This one is single response. This one is another, another breakpoint. Um, and, and again, the reason I show this off is it's really useful for assessments and looking for individual values. It's even more useful for developers who are used to rich debuggers and then have to work with stateless 
uh, web applications and they get really frustrated. So I highly recommend it as a development tool. Um, I was going to pause there, answer any questions, and also invite Aaron Guzman, who is the LA area Zap evangelist, to talk about some of the more advanced features of the scripting language. Any questions before we shuffle? Yes. Intruder? Um, what kind of intruder? Is that a tool or not? Oh, oh, the burp intruder. Um, that's not, okay. Remind me which one that, is that the where it replaces values? Um, yep. So the question was, does, does Zap have a feature like Burp Intruder, which allows you to have very detailed control over replacing parameter values? Um, the answer is it's not as sophisticated as Burp, but the fuzzer does allow you to specify dictionaries uh, or use random values or use a, uh, a set value and then um, you know put it in multiple parameters. Uh, I don't think I actually have a lot of time to go into that right now. Um, it's fairly easy to use. I would actually say it's easier to use than Burp, if it's even though it might be slightly less powerful. Um, Aaron, are you are ready to put up, be put on the spot? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're gonna switch up. Um, Aaron knows a tremendous amount about the Zest scripting language that Mozilla is working on that makes it easier to. I'm surrounded by cords. Okay, I'm gonna move out of here. Makes it easier to um, automate a custom attack in Zap. Say you're worried about a particular thing like click jacking that might not be covered as well as you want in the standard modules. You can write your own. Mm. If you don't have the script console installed, you're gonna have to restart um, because this was a fresh install. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, if let's you do this. Save your results. You can. You know, do you want to? Do, do you want to do that? Okay, let's fix it. Yeah. And it was on the desktop. Oh, you got it. Mm -hmm. Just trying. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron, and um, I really wanted to show uh, how powerful uh, the script scripting is in in Zap. Not only Zest, but um, you can use Python, Ruby. Um, and you can specify a lot of the th custom, um, like for example, like responses, uh, requests, depending on what whatever you're looking at. So you can have it as a proxy, uh, for example. So they have a couple templates here. I'm not going to go in depth as far as how to set them up, but literally, I mean, you're just going to. So let's say we want to do a, a proxy script here for for Zest. Change all posts to gets and see if it's allowed. Uh, so you just do new script. There you go. Um, whatever one we can do a, a proxy as it is, as it is, it's already going to be Zest. Um, so this is an example here. Uh, we're, we're not going to do this. It's actually very, much more easier than this. So all you got to do for Zest, literally, right click. Uh, you want to add, um, you know, let's see, some some Zest conditions. We can add, you know, uh, every let's say, I don't know. 302 redirection, we want to uh, specify um, whatever the case may be. Check for the length, um, uh, write, write your own script. Um, let's see, you can add, you know, whatever parameter you're going to specify to scan. Um, that's just one aspect. Now, what you can also do is, I don't know how familiar you guys are with uh, uh, CSP. Uh, basically protecting against, you know, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and all that. Uh, you can use Zap to uh, intercept that, intercept the, um, the CSP uh, headers, and what you can do is basically eliminate CSP altogether, um, and I believe there should be, uh, well, you can, you, it's possible to create uh, a script through that, and now let me see if we can actually update, because there's a simpler way. Jeez, there's a lot. Um, there's some updated templates, put it that way, that gets you started with 
that aspect so you can focus on on testing uh, cross-site scripting without worrying about CSP, uh, for example. Um, you can also, uh, so say you want to fuzz or iterate through uh, your sites tree, which is here, you know, if I had sites here, uh, change your user agents, bogus user agents. Yes. Uh, the, the talk is still set up on the Firefox site, but you do have other sites. Okay. Do you want to demonstrate how we can take the user agents and load the objects? Sure. Yeah, we can do that. So, there. So now that here, here are the uh, the add-ons, the list, the loads of add-ons you can you can use for um, for Zap here. Now, I mean, they go through iterations uh, whenever they're updated. The rules, as you can see here, is on the eleventh update. Uh, I mean, the the contribution between uh, with Zap and um, I mean, it's it's daily. There's there's conversations between the developers, between users. So there's always updates. So we can let's see. Let's do SQL Map. Uh, since a lot of people like to use that. And let's do use, um, let's add some HTTP info, some Python, uh, Wappalyzer to see what the server's running. So if it's running Node.js, if it's running whatever the case may be, Knockout, uh, we can check that. Now it's all dynamic too, so you can see. Um, it's almost done. We could even close it if we wanted to. Um, so you can, so for example, there was this latest, uh, like the Facebook vulnerability, the external entities, if we want, with OpenID, we can specify whenever we see uh, an OpenID, uh, you know, request um, to do, you know, a number of, uh, of checks there uh, to upload, you know, um, and run um, arbitrary, arbitrary commands, for example. So... Um, there's different use cases, whatever, you know, I guess your situation is, or even if you're a consultant, you can make it much easier. Every time you want to test, um, you know, I mean, just iterate through these site trees with, uh, let's see, let's see here, you can loop through the history table, you can look through comments, look for syncs, look for sources in uh, JavaScript, and from there determine, you know, where, where the issue may lie. So, uh, and then you can, you know, drill down from there.